I'm Russ Roberts. I'm a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. I'm also the host of Econ Talk weekly podcast. There's a consensus among most economists, a lot of po public policy pundits, politicians, and even a good part of the general public, that the economic prosperity of the last 30 or 40 years, which has been quite substantial, is not shared very widely. Most, if not all of it, has gone to the rich or the richest of the rich, the top 1%. The middle class is either stagnant, the poor are not benefiting from this economic growth. And as a result, there's a lot of unease, I think, among the public and among a lot of economists that the economy is, is not performing as productively as it has in the past across a wide range of the population. Now, my view on this is that it's more complicated than the numbers suggest. Certainly, there are numbers that suggest that there's been economic stagnation for large part of the, of the American public. But I think that those numbers are misleading. I think they're distorted by changes in family structure, by the challenge of measuring inflation accurately, by the choice of the sample, which people are included or not included, and as also by what we count as income, what we count as economic well-being. Uh, a lot of income measures we have are incomplete. They don't include benefits. A lot of inflation measures, I think, are uh, not uh, accurate. They overstate inflation and therefore understate the gains going to the average person. And finally, I think the changes in family structure in the United States over the last 40 years, there's been an enormous change in the amount of marriage, and it's disproportionately uh, a change among less educated Americans who tend to have lower wages. That's caused the measurement of economic progress to look very mediocre for large groups of the population. But in fact, when we follow the same people over time, rather than looking at snapshots, say, at one point in time and comparing it to another point in time, if we follow the same people, we get a very different picture. So I think there's some grounds for optimism. And I think that the standard view, the what I'd call the mainstream view that everything's lousy for the average American, I think is, is grossly overstated. And it's more complicated than that. And I'd like to see economists who write about this talk about it and do research on it uh, at least mention the possibility that their results are not as reliable as they often claim to be. So I'm generally more optimistic in my assessment of how the economy's performed over the last 30 or 40 years with respect to the middle class and with respect to the poor, but I don't see that as a defense of the status quo. I think there are a lot of things we need to do to make the economy more effective and more importantly, uh, provide more opportunity for human beings. So the goal in, in economic life isn't to grow the economy per se, it's to give people a chance to flourish, to give people a chance to use their skills, to give people a chance to participate in uh, working with others in, in the modern, in the modern uh, workplace. And two areas I would focus on in thinking about how to make things better, even though I think they're better than most people are, say they are, but two areas to work on I think are how we treat some industries, and we give a lot of favorable treatment to the financial sector. The uh, bailouts of 2008 I think were a terrible disaster both for the, uh, for the actual economy, uh, they encouraged a lot of recklessness that we're gonna pay for it down the road, they also discourage people about how they think about our economic system, rightfully so. They see it as, as rigged. I don't think the whole system is rigged, but certainly there are powerful groups that get particular favors, and we should, we should work to stop that. Uh, we should make it harder for uh, people to use other people's money uh, to benefit themselves. And of course, we give away a lot of goodies to the rich, and such as through the financial sector and preferential treatment and tax breaks, we should get rid of those and that I think would reduce the amount of inequality that we see. And now at the other end of the economic spectrum, the poorest Americans, the people who are struggling to, to make ends meet, we certainly should do everything we can to remove barriers that keep them from participating in the, in the economy and, and using their skills to the fullest and leading a satisfying life. Two obvious things to mention there are the gr terrible growth in occupational licensing that makes it harder for people to get started in the workplace, makes it harder for people to get experience. And even more basically, our education system, which I think does a particularly bad job with the lowest income and poorest Americans, people growing up in the poorest households, those kids are getting a very mediocre, if not a bad education. And the current system, which has been the case for the last uh, two generations, tragically, uh, has not changed sufficiently to help them become part of, part of the economy. So those are, things I think we have to do, they're incredibly important. So 
my general view of the economy, although I think the economy has a lot of good things going for it, certainly I don't think the status quo is, is sacred in any way. There's plenty of things we need to do to make things better. It's really hard to measure inflation. What the government does, whether they're using the consumer price index or the personal consumption expenditure index or the GDP price deflator, there's all kinds of different indices. They're all making different assumptions about a very challenging question, which is people buy a lot of different things. Some of those things get more expensive. Some of them get cheaper. But every index has to try to measure all prices. You don't want to exclude certain prices. So when we correct for inflation in these series, or we're talking about work that corrects for inflation, they include everything in terms of what they measure. They don't measure perfectly. That's still a challenge. But they, don't, they, they certainly include the co rising cost of health care, the rising cost of housing, the rising cost of education, and they also include the, well, some of the decreasing things, such as electronics and sometimes food items, although it depends on the time period and, and which food items. But the idea is to create a basket of things, that, a broad range of stuff that, that most, if not all, Americans are, are purchasing. It's, it's imperfect. And the biggest challenge in measuring inflation accurately is, for me, is quality change. So when a good gets higher quality, that means it's, in many times it's gotten effectively cheaper, but if the price you actually pay hasn't gotten cheaper, that won't show up in the index. So there are a lot of challenges in measuring inflation. It is imperfect, and everybody purchases like, uh, their own basket of goods. It's slightly different from the one that the government uses to try to assess the overall change in prices. But you've got to make assumptions like that if you're going to compare incomes in, say, 2010 with incomes in 1970. Incomes in 2010 are a lot higher than 1970, but so are prices. And what we care about is what you can buy with that income, your command over goods and services. But if you start to think about it, you realize, hmm, well, the health care I could buy in 1970, it's certainly gotten a lot more expensive, but it's also a lot better. There are a lot of things that didn't even exist in 1970 at any price. How do you control for that? For same thing with, with electronics. Electronics are often cheaper than they used to be, but they're not just cheaper, they're also better. Your, iP uh, your iPod, your music player, just to take an example, your television. It, it might even be more expensive today than it was in 1970, but if you look at a 1970 television, you'd go, oh my gosh, I wouldn't, it's hardly, it's unimaginably inferior to what we have today in terms of color and quality of picture and choices of, of uh, what to watch on television. So we do a very imperfect job as economists in, in correcting for that, and that's going to inevitably affect our assessment of how well uh, the economy is doing. Because if, uh, if inflation is overstated, because we haven't corrected for quality, we're going to understate our ability to purchase stuff uh, with our incomes, and therefore we won't measure growth and, and economic well-being correctly. One of the goals of this series is to sensitize viewers, uh, you out there watching, about how to think about numbers and data and how to keep from being fooled. A lot of people with an axe to grind on either the left or the right will include or exclude various uh, types of data. They'll change the defini definition of income. They'll decide on a particular measure of inflation. They'll change the sample. They'll ignore changes in family structure. and so. What we're trying to do in this series is to make you realize how sensitive the final results are to many of these different assumptions. So when you see somebody say, the average worker hasn't gotten a raise in the last 40 years, which is a claim that some economists make with a straight face, that might make you think that, oh my gosh, there's, there's this whole group of people who worked and worked and worked for the exact same wage for 40 years and never got a raise. Uh, and that's um, simply not true. That conclusion comes from taking a group of people at a point in time and then taking a different snapshot 40 or 30, 30 or 40 years later and implying that they're the same people. Of course, they're not the same people. People live, get born, they die, they get uh, retire, they join the workforce. So one of the things you want to start when you, when you look at these kind of questions and you hear somebody make a claim is saying, well, are you following the same people over time or are you looking at snapshots of people at different points in time and therefore different populations? If you're looking at different sna a snapshot at different points in time, you're going to want to ask, well, how much movement was there in and out? You want to ask, what inflation measure did they use to correct for the fact that prices are higher and therefore you have to correct for inflation? Does the sample include the elderly? Does it include people you wouldn't expect to be able to benefit from economic growth because they're typically retired or working very little? Have they corrected for family structure? Uh, did they include all the measures of economic uh, well-being that matter? 
So a lot of measures will use wages, ignoring non-monetary compensation, benefits of various kinds. Some people will include transfers because they want to make the picture rosier than, than, they, than it might otherwise be. Uh, so you want to, first of all, when you, hear, when you look at a graph or you see a claim made by someone who's advocating for something, you want to ask, how did they measure it? What was included? What was the time frame? Was there a reason they left out some years that might have made their results look a little bit different? These are just some of the questions you want to ask <clears throat> because you're not in the kitchen uh, when they're uh, cooking up that, uh, that number. And it's remarkable how many decisions go into what seems to be a fact. Most of these things we're talking about in this area aren't real facts. They're what I would call factoids. They are the creation of a set of decisions that the researchers made. And the results are sensitive to those decisions. And people can come along, and they have, and they get different results uh, just because they make different assumptions. And both assumptions sometimes uh, on a particular decision can be reasonable. So then what do you do? You've got one economist who's really smart, has really good credentials saying that the economic system has failed a whole group of people for the last 40 years. You have another economist, also smart, also credentials, like, no, 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 it's, it's fantastic. And those two results, they have facts, both of them have facts uh, on their side, but are one of the facts better than the other? And the answer to that depends on, on two things. One, one is sometimes it's reasonable to make a different decision because you're looking at a different aspect of economic policy, you're trying to answer a different question. So just to take an example, if you want to know how a group of people is doing overall, you might want to include government transfers and taxes in assessing it, assessing that well-being. But if you're really only interested in how the economy is performing, whether it's helping people, you'd want to probably exclude government transfers and taxes and only look at economic uh, market income and, and investment income that, that those people receive. Again, making sure you include uh, benefits as a part of compensation because they're increasingly important over the, last, over the last 40 years. But once you've done that and you've looked at those different assumptions, you can still get very different results. And so then what do you do? Which one should you believe? And I think we have a tendency to believe the one that makes us happier as opposed to the one that's actually totally true. Uh, we, get, we have our own ideologies. So if you're on the left, you're more likely to sympathize with an economist on the left who tells you something. If you're on the right or you're more free market, less interventionist, you're going to be more sympathetic to the economist who tells you that things are maybe a little bit better. So which one's right? And I think it's really important to recognize the fact that that's not so easy to determine. The people who make these claims on the left and on the right are often really certain. They make it sound like they've established this as the truth. And I think it's very honest and helpful to realize that the truth is a little bit elusive. It's not so straightforward. And when I look at these numbers, I, you know, I, again, I can tell lots of different stories. And in the first episode of this series, show exactly how extreme, and that's just the beginning, I think, of how extreme you can make the different stories depending on which assumptions you make. But I think there are other bigger picture ways of thinking about this that, that, are, that are helpful. But even so, I think you have to be honest and say, this is not a simple question to answer whether the economy is treating the middle class well, for example. That's not a simple question to answer, especially when you realize that there's so many other things going on besides the economy. An example we've been looking at in some of the videos in this series is the change in family structure. Enormous change in the proportion of the American, in the proportion of the American population that's married. And because we're often using household income to evaluate the progress of the economy, and we're changing the number of households and changing the structure of the households to an increasing number of single person unmarried households, that just has a huge effect on your assessment of, of how the economy is treating, say, the middle quintile of the income distribution or the so-called middle class or the poor. And once you recognize that, I think it should give you some humility in how confident you are and how badly or how well you think things are going. And I know that's not so fun. <laughs> you really want to have something you can hold on to. But I think with economic data, it's often the case that it's just hard to know with any precision. Uh, so I think that's a challenge that we have to be honest about. I want to thank everyone for watching. If you have additional questions or comments or reactions, please share them in the comments below.